Welcome everyone to the next episode of the Nonstop Nonprofit Podcast. This is your new host, David Schwab. I am the head of marketing at Fundraise. This is my good friend, John Walsh, joining us today. John has a rich background of experience in many different nonprofit organizations, but what I invited him here today to talk about specifically is his knowledge about digital fundraising. John doesn't know this, but I've always thought of him kind of as a professor of digital fundraising, digital marketing, really wise and experienced and knows the space as good or better than anyone. It's fitting now because John actually works at a seminary or works for a seminary. So that title of professor almost fits. But John, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, David. It's great to be here. All right. Well, I think we should just jump right in. I'd love to hear from you. Can you give our audience just a little bit of your background, where you work today, what you do, how you got into the digital space? And then uh, what was it that first got you into the fundraising space, the nonprofit sector? And then what has kept you coming back? Yeah, uh, that's that's a great question. Uh, so I am currently the Director of Annual Giving at St. Vladimir's Seminary. As you mentioned, it's a, it's a seminary a higher ed institute, but that wasn't my first job. I actually, my first career, my first career was in music and music education. So the professor kind of works for that as well. And I was working in music therapy at a nursing facility doing music there. And my boss came up to me and said, we have a Facebook page. You have a Facebook page. Can you do our Facebook page for us? Since it was my boss, the answer was obviously, yes, I'd be happy to do Facebook, even though I have you know very little experience except for my own personal dealings with Facebook. So I said yes. And from there, it was just this great enjoyment that I had with, with digital marketing. I started doing the social media. I started taking the pictures or writing the content. And then I started seeing the results you know, being able to see things in real time, seeing how things did, being able to test images or content. From there, that snowballed into the email newsletter for them. And then when the site wasn't well optimized for the newsletter, it was, hey, we need to work on the site so that we can direct people from the email and the social media to the website. So it just, just became this, this real love for me with with digital marketing. And so I went back to school, did some schooling for digital marketing. And uh, when I was trying to get my first job into digital marketing, I was looking at of all the different areas in digital marketing, social ads, web content, email, which ones really kind of spoke to me? And it, it was email marketing. I, I just loved email marketing. Like most email marketers, I feel like we kind of fell into it. And that's just how it, how it works for us. Uh, same time, same some ways for nonprofits. And that's actually how I got my first nonprofit job in nonprofit and in digital marketing. Email marketing was with a large Christian nonprofit. I uh, did email marketing for them for five years. We would send anywhere from 40 to 60 million emails a year. It was a great fun. I learned so much with that experience and just just grew from there. The fundraising grew from there. And that's really kind of where my, I guess, to answer your one last question is where my love for it came from is, was at that organization. Just seeing the power of digital fundraising. I know you and I have talked maybe even a little bit about, you know, the kind of the difference between direct mail and digital and, you know, direct mail is still a wonderful communication tool and still really brings in the money. But don't count out email and don't count out digital mm -hmm. because it's, it's becoming more and more popular. And it's just it's just a, such a great way and a great interaction with people to see how much they care about their cause, to be able to send, whether it's an email or a social media post, and just get that that feedback from them about, you know, they care about this cause so much that they're willing to give. I, I mean, I still get choked up sometimes when I see kind of the... Uh, the odd numbered donations come in, whether it's like twenty one seventy five or, you know, sixteen dollars and three cents. So that's just it's just great to see that, and to just just to know that these people are giving all to the cause that they care about. Yeah, I think it must be so interesting for you and your role now too, because you're coming into a director of development role from a digital background. Most people who come into a director development role come into it from like a major gift or a traditional fundraising background. And so I remember having a conversation with you when you were first getting started in this role and you're like, I've got to go figure out direct mail for the first time. <laughs> we're not going to get into direct mail here. I'm sorry for anyone listening who who loves direct mail, but John and I are, are digital guys. We're going to keep talking digital, but I just... 
I think it's got to be so interesting for you to be learning probably for the first time or for the first time in a long time, that piece of the fundraising side compared to what most people in or most director DODs in your in roles like yours are learning the digital piece for the first time. So maybe a fun question just following up on that is like, what has been the most challenging shift from very focused digital fundraiser, email marketer to being director of development and overseeing the whole gambit of development for an entire organization? Yeah, I think that's it right there. It's it's having that broader view. Uh, before it was just solely being able to put my nose down, my head down and say, okay, email, tell me when to send it. I'm going to send an email. Okay, I got it. It's sent. You know, now it's, okay, we need to fundraise for a whole campaign. Oh, John, you need to come up with a whole campaign for Giving Tuesday. It needs to have multiple touch points. It needs to go to multiple different segments. It needs to, you know, it needs to have these multiple different videos or content. And it's learning for me is learning how to put all that together and how to make it successful. So, and this is, this is actually really why I ended up back in, or why I ended up into digital marketing is because it's such a learning process and digital is so, as you know, tomorrow is going to change. And, mm-hmm. and what we're, what we're doing now, uh, we're going to have to learn something different again, you know, in a, in a, in a week or a month, a year, uh, which really which excites me. And I think it should excite a lot of nonprofits as well, because we're going to be having to change too. We're, you know, our, our demographic donor demographics are changing in a few years. People are becoming more familiar with email and more mm-hmm. comfortable donating with the, on email. And they're going to become more comfortable donating on social. Mm-hmm. Just, that broad view for me has really been a challenge, incorporating, as you said, direct mail, learning the nuances of each one, whether it's email compared to direct mail or social media. Digital is fine. I'm good with that. But just understanding it and understanding the mindset really coming into it, right? When you're coming into an email, you're probably scrolling through your inbox. You're not really maybe expecting an email from an organization, but something catches your eye, whether it's the from name or the subject line, and then you're transported really into into content. Whereas direct mail, it's a little different. Just mm-hmm. you know, you've had time to to pick it up from the mailbox and flip through. And you know, I've heard of stories of people who just kind of sit in their easy armchairs and enjoy you know a long letter. So yeah, it's all of that learning for me, and that's what really excites me. Yeah. I remember I, I got my, my fundraising career started in direct mail. And I remember we talked so often about things like, how do we get people to open envelopes? How do we increase our open rate? And I was like, well, how do you really know what your open rate is? But then when we when I first got plugged into the email fundraising, I was like, you can actually like, you can see when people are engaging and you can tell what works and what doesn't work. And now we're years past that and and open rates and and all of that engagement stuff is changing yet again. But I just thought that was such an interesting piece is I think for for those who have come up through a direct mail background or are really familiar with direct mail fundraising, the biggest difference is direct mail fundraising is the lead time, right? It's it takes 2 to 3 months to plan a piece, produce and and send, and then it takes 2 to 3 months to actually see how it works. Whereas in digital, you're doing two to three to four campaigns in that cycle and seeing in real time how it comes. And that's always been my piece and, and my why for being in digital is I just don't have the patience. I call it ADHD or just the fact that I, you know, I'm from the generation that grew up as digital natives. I don't have the patience to do things over the course of months and months. So I, I want that instant gratification. So John, what I kind of like to do next is give some people a reason if they still don't believe that digital is is worth investing in, specifically email, because I know that's your bread and butter, but why should an organization, if they haven't already, invest in digital or more specifically invest in an email program? Yeah, I think a lot of the studies that I'm reading, a lot of the reports I'm reading are showing that people prefer email as a main form of communication. And even the, the younger demographic, but even the older demographic as well, prefer email as a form of communication. So I, you can't dismiss it anymore. It's mm-hmm. It's here. I mean, it's not... 
it seems young and maybe compared to direct mail it is, but it's not that young compared to maybe social media. You know, it's been around 70, 80 years. It's not only a great form of communication, people open it, people want it. I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's not just, oh, this is a great form of communication, but people are saying of all the communications, I want email and we have to pay attention to that. If they're saying it, we need to pay attention to it. And it's not just one study, it's multiple studies, not just nonprofits, it's across the board, all sectors that want and respect and, and respond to email. We're also seeing an increase in giving through email. Mm -hmm. And that's really with, again, I, I attribute it to people feeling more comfortable with it. The landing pages are getting better. The emails are getting better. We're, we're no longer in our toddler years, maybe mm -hmm. email and, and we're, we're maturing enough. Whereas direct mail has been around for so long that they already have it down. I think mm -hmm. email is still growing and, and we're still learning, but we're no longer toddlers either. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we're tweens or teens. I don't know. A great comparison. Uh, we do we're, have a lot we're of all attitude. angsty teenage fundraisers. <laughs> so us email marketers have a lot of attitude. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, and I think that's really, so if you're a nonprofit who's not, and, and I, you know, I, that's the other thing I can talk about is, is multi-channel, right? And I think mm -hmm. that's really what it comes down to. And I've seen, because I'm a big person who loves reading studies and reports I've mentioned already, multi-channel is very important. And even if you are a direct mail, you know, focus, which is fine, we've, we're finding that people give more if they receive multi-channel communication. Even if they only give through one channel, and even if that channel mm -hmm. is direct mail only, People give more through direct mail only if they've also received an email communication. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they only receive direct mail, no other communication, they give less. So even if you're not using it as a fundraiser, which I recommend you do because you're already emailing, you need to be using it because it's a complete package, right? And we're a noisy society. Inboxes are noisy. Mailboxes are noisy. So the more touch points you can put for mm -hmm. people, the better. Yeah, I think it's so important that you talked about multi-channel and the touch points in that study. We did a study at my last agency when I was still working full-time as a fundraiser. We had a theory that multiple touch points would increase direct mail, right? So we were working with many organizations all over the all over the world at that point trying to help them figure out how to acquire more donors through the mail. And we said, well, what if we created a system where if someone is on your mailing list, we also deliver digital advertising to them because they're new. So you don't have their email. So you can't reach out to them that way. We said, well, we think direct mail as a program will be increased by having these additional touch points. We didn't think it would do anything to digital. But what we actually saw is having multiple touch points across different media types increased performance everywhere, not just direct mail. So we did a blind study where a control group got just direct mail. Then we did a study of direct mail plus the digital advertising overlay. And we expected to see a lift in direct mail, but we also saw a lift over standard performance in digital advertising, which is very interesting because that means the offline touch point that was made to those potential donors increased their digital activity, not just the other way around. So yeah. like you said, it's so important to be thinking about a holistic communication strategy to your donors. And the way that I think digital is most important in that today is being the way that it amplifies the story you're telling. Because it's expensive to send a letter. There's mm -hmm. paper and postage and production and, and the time delay and all of the things that go into sending a letter. Whereas digital, you can, for every one thing you can say through the letter, you can say four or five, six different things or tell the story from a few different angles in digital. And that's why I, I like it so much as a, a lever to increase that communication strategy. Yeah. And I think you touched on a, on a good point uh, with the with the timing issue. Uh, we dealt with this a lot at the place I was at before this as well, which is, as you said, you need two to three months lead time. Mm -hmm. Well, if something major is happening in the news, I mean, we just went through an earthquake in Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time that gets out in direct mail, it could very well be out of your donor's yeah. mind, right? So that's the beauty about email. And, and we used to push this and, and talk about it a lot is, look, Ed, we can talk about it direct mail in two months when it's ready, but we need to talk about it in email now because right. the news cycle happens so fast Mm -hmm. People are ready to respond right then. Not that you can't wait two months, but email is such a great, not only just email, but digital, whether it's mm -hmm. app, social, email, is such a great way to help with that urgency. And we nonprofits, we talk about urgency all the time, right? You need to get, you need to get that story out there right when it's mm -hmm. happening. It reminds me, do you remember a few years ago when 
that crazy winter storm hit Dallas. Mm -hmm. It's probably 20 early 2021, I think is when it was. I was working with a, an organization in Dallas, a homeless shelter and relief organization, and they were literally the first people with boots on the ground because they are already operating day in and day out in Dallas, and they had their direct mail program, and this whole weather storm hit and caused hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of physical damage to their organization and their shelters, and... While they were trying to figure out what do we do with the direct mail program, like we were about to send our Easter fundraising letter. It has nothing to do with what's going on right now, but we were able to pivot in digital. And in less than a week, they had raised nearly $200,000 to rebuild and provide emergency relief. It was one of their most successful digital campaigns. And it's like you said, it's just because digital, you can work at the pace of the news cycle and you can move at the pace of conversation. It's one of the beauties of being able to be responsive to the environment you're working in and also being a good steward of your resources at a nonprofit organization because every time you do something, it costs something, right? And nonprofit organizations have limited resources. So when you're able to be nimble and responsive like that, it provides just such a huge return. It does. And email still has a great return. It's still, as far as I know, like $40 for every one. So, well, We've talked about multi-channel fundraising. We've talked about how digital and email roll into that. I think at this point, I'm hoping everyone listening is is in. They're saying, I'm in. I know I need to do this. Maybe some are asking, how do I get started? What would you say are some benchmarks of performance or some some standard critical strategies and things someone should do if they're just getting their email program started out or if they're trying to take their email program to the next level? You know, I think for me, I, I break it up into basically two different types of emails. If you're just getting started, because each type of email has a little bit of a different feel and a different flavor. So you have what we talked about were communication emails, and then you have your just your fundraising emails. Communication emails are things like newsletters, things like events. Maybe you're trying to get people to sign up for an event, surveys, those, those kind of emails, those are a little different than your fundraising email. And so when you're really first starting, you need to know the kind. And I think you need to use, just so you understand, you need to use both. Uh, this is, we talked about a holistic approach. So and one, I guess my kind of my pet peeves with email is those that only use fundraising emails and don't use the newsletter or the free resource, which is another email I love, like giving people something. So mm -hmm. what I talk a lot about uh, when you're first starting an email program is provide value. You're going to have to build a relationship with people. They're going to have to get to know you. They're going to get to know your voice, your organization, your your cause, your mission. They're going to get to know that. Provide value to them. Give them, like I said, give them resources. Write articles and put them on your website to direct them to that. Or videos, direct them there. You can even direct them to your social media pages, right? So just start to really build a rapport with them so that they become familiar with you. They see you in their inbox they look forward to seeing you in their inbox. It's not mm -hmm. like, oh no, here's another fundraising email. And maybe you get them too, but I have like certain ones where it's like every day I get a fundraising email from a nonprofit. It's like, okay, what do you, I mean, I saw it sounds me, but what are you going to give to me? Like, <laughs> yep. so, but you need to, so you need to build that relationship. You need to provide value and you need to fundraise. And sometimes I have to tell nonprofits that as well. Like use email to fundraise. It's okay. It's, it's mm -hmm. acceptable. Like, you know, there's always stories of people who, and you'll probably hear it, oh, so-and-so got mad because they, they sent me a fundraising email. It's like, we're nonprofits. This is our job. We're, we're in it. We're not just fundraising because we want money. We're fundraising it for a purpose. And when you go into fundraising emails, that's really what you have to explain. So I guess that was a long introduction, but there's two types. And I think when you talk about fundraising emails, you really need to talk about calls to action. And with a fundraising email, it needs to have one call to action. So often I see emails where it's like, hey, we want you to give money, but also sign up for this event and fill out this form and email us back if you have questions and you've now lost your audience. They don't know what to do. And usually what happen is they'll do the one action you don't want them to do and mm -hmm. they won't do the one action you really wanted them to do. I don't know how many times I've had this conversation with like, oh, we didn't get much money on that email. And it's like, that's because we had like four calls to action. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. of course we didn't get much. And they're like, Oh yeah, I remember you telling me not to do that. So it'll happen. But with fundraising emails, keep it simple. Really, you know, explain the need, the problem, explain your response to it. A fundraising email might be a little longer than a kind of a typical email because you have to do a little bit more in it and you don't want to send them to a story to do it or a video to do it. So keep it simple. You can have more than one, as they call the action, you can have more than one link in an email as long as it's going to the same place. With mm -hmm. the newsletter, it's different. 
right? And so getting started, just really know your kind of your types, know how to use them. We can talk about cadence if you want, uh, how frequent to email. If you're just getting started, email at least once a month if you're Mm -hmm. just getting started. But honestly, it's okay to email more. And we found this out going through the the pandemic. Uh, We started emailing more. Mm -hmm. And as long as, I go back to this, as long as you're providing value to them, they will open your emails. And so if you're doing that, once a week is okay. As long as it's not mm-hmm. a fundraising email once a week. But if you're providing that that interesting content that they love, they'll come back again and again and again. And then they'll and then they'll donate as well. Yeah, it's interesting you talked about that cadence. I was just talking with another nonprofit exec. He was talking about how he's worried that his email communication volume is too high and he was sending one email a quarter. <sighs> And I was like, they probably don't even know you exist. Like, probably not. And you're just getting started. So the people you're talking to are the most loyal supporters you're ever going to have as an organization. Send one a month. He's like, he's like, don't wait. I can't do it. I can't do it. It's too much. And I was like, think about how many emails you get every day from Gap or if you're my wife from Target. Like, think about how many emails you get every single day. Now, imagine trying to stand out against that volume if you're only sending to someone once a quarter. And that's when it clicked. That's the difficult thing about successfully running an email program as a nonprofit is you're not just competing with the other organizations that your donors and supporters support or follow. You're competing with their entire inbox, personal, and then also likely their professional inbox, which may be sorted in the same. Like If you're like me and you have the mail app on your iPhone, you get your work email in one section and then your personal email in another section. And so you've got to work hard to to stand out. And I think what you touched on is is critical in that it's like you want to make people look for your emails. You want to have great stories that you're telling. And, and that's the secret sauce and the secret weapon, in my opinion, as a nonprofit professional trying to succeed in email fundraising and email marketing is you've got better stories to tell than anyone else in your donor's inbox or your supporter's inbox. And they chose to follow you. They chose to subscribe to you. They chose to support you for a reason. They likely care about your cause. So if you're telling good stories and what we always used to call them is is we said, cultivate the relationship before you ask for something from the relationship. So if you're sending great cultivation emails, then you're primed to make the ask. And that ask can be as frequent as once or twice a week if you're also doing the other piece. Right. Yeah, and I think I think you you said it right there. And I think people, I'm I'm finding that people are right. They're way more engaged. They really care a lot more about your email than they do about the three gap emails, mm-hmm. or you know what I mean. Like they're really they're more invested in in those than they probably are. Honestly, not not all e-commerce brands, but just the influx of emails. They're they're yeah. At least I'm finding we we actually just did a survey with our group with our donors and and our supporters I should say just to find out you know were we emailing too much too little and overwhelmingly it was like you guys are right on like and we're emailing mm-hmm. once or twice a week we're throwing a, a fundraising email maybe in once a week or once every other week but like you said we're cultivating the relationships we're 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 doing events we're a live stream events and and other things just to keep them engaged and they and they do appreciate mm-hmm. it yeah i think it's interesting i always look at what's happening in the for profit sector as a benchmark right mm-hmm. and in the for profit sector like a really 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 healthy open rate in the e-commerce space or in the if you're if you're emailing customers a really healthy open rate is like 5% click through rate one percent you're celebrating and when i was doing email fundraising our open rates were like 25 to 30 percent and that was a bad email click-through rates were 10 to 15 percent on average and it shows that it, i mean for everyone listening like i want you to hear the people you're talking to want to hear from you you just need to give them something worth reading right you said it right there that's exactly right give them something worth reading because they're 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 you are standing out in their inbox so just just make it in there. <laughs> All right, John, we've convinced everyone. Digital, checkmark, email, let's do it. I know where to get started. We've got some good ideas to get started. But it's also really important to make sure your digital file is healthy. Uh, what are some things, as one of the experts in the space, what are some things you recommend watching for or signs to say, hey, my my file is healthy or my file is unhealthy and what do I need to do to turn it around? Yeah, that, that's a great question because it's something near and dear to my heart. My previous place, we when, when I first started there, our, our file was not very healthy. Uh, we were looking at what we call a sender reputation score that was pretty low. Uh, and that's just 
a, a score that they kind of give you to kind of gauge how well your emails are landing in the inbox or not landing in the inbox or landing in spam. And so it was pretty low. And so we, we, I looked at it very hard to see, you know, what we could do to improve it. Because if your emails aren't landing in the inbox or promotions tab, then your emails aren't, will never get read. Uh, it, it doesn't know, <laughs> matter how hard you try, they have to get into the inbox. And a lot of emails don't make it. Uh, and so it's very important to have what I say call clean lists or clean data. For me and for nonprofits, I recommend removing anyone who hasn't opened an email from your organization in a year or longer. And it's not just a, a made up number and it's not just for just because I like things clean and orderly. Um, there's actually technical reasons behind it. When you are sending to people who don't open your emails for two years, three years, and if those emails are dormant for whatever reason, maybe they're not using that email anymore, the email service provider can pick them up and make them into spam traps. And then once they, if you start hitting spam, tra spam traps, then you know the worst that could happen is you get blacklisted. Also, could your emails won't get delivered. They just won't make it into the person's inbox at all. So I recommend, we used to do it once a year, is clean our file. That doesn't mean you have to get rid of them. It doesn't mean you take them out of your file and never see them again. It just means like when we were talking about a consistent cadence and it's consistent communication, you're not keeping them in there the whole time. Maybe you pull out those people who haven't engaged with you in a year and you send them a re-engagement email a few months later, or maybe you send them a re-engagement email during Giving Tuesday, but keep them separate from your daily, weekly, monthly communication, because what could happen, the worst, like I said, that could happen is you could really hurt yourself and make it so you can't email the people that mm -hmm. want to receive the emails. Right. So if you end up in spam traps, it doesn't affect just the people who don't want it. It affects the people who want it. Google or Gmail and Apple, they don't they don't care. They just it's just an algorithm and they just, you know, put it put it where they think it needs to go. So really clean your list. Like I said, once a year, use reengagement campaigns to get them to, you know, to try to pull them back in. That's that's completely fine. Great, great practice. You know, a lot of neat nonprofits will say, you know, well, I, well, I guess the other thing is, is list size. I mean, maybe we could talk about that real quick, right? Uh, it's like the bigger, the better. And that's not the case. You want, you want great engagement. It's the best mm -hmm. way to put it, right? Whether mm -hmm. that is a million people or whether that is 10,000 people or 1,000 people, if you have 1,000 people and you're getting them, if you're getting half of them to open, that's better than having a million people with 100 people opening. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm just trying to say, don't get fixated on that number, which is really easy to do. Like, oh man, I got, you know, I'm sending to 10,000 people. That may be fine, but it may not be. It's okay. It's really okay mm -hmm. to, to cut that down a little bit. And you're not doing anybody a disservice. Nobody's probably sitting at home saying, you know, where's that email? If they haven't opened in a year, they're probably not saying, why haven't I heard from them? It's been two years. Yeah. Great tips. So something something that I really wanted to to touch on today, kind of switching gears, but I, while I had you here, wanted to talk about trends. Fundraise published an article a couple months ago now that talked about trends to look for in 2023. It was one of our most popular articles that we published in the last year plus. Gets me thinking people are trying to figure out what's coming and how to navigate. I think we're all kind of in that boat together. We don't know what's coming. We don't know what the economy is going to be like. We don't know what the global environment is going to look like tomorrow, let alone a year from now. So I want to talk trends with you because I know you study this thoroughly year in and year out. So I'm going to start with looking back at, at last year, 2022. What are some of the things that you saw in digital fundraising, in email fundraising that stood out? What are some trends that you thought were really interesting, that caught your eye, that surprised you? Yeah. Yeah. So there were a couple last year, about a year and a half ago, Apple came out with the mail privacy protection. And that was the big deal in the email community. It had us all up in, in, in a tizzy, I used to say, just because we, you know, all of the email markers didn't know what to do now. Uh, we didn't even know what it was going to be and how it was going to affect us. Uh, and so really, for those of you who don't know, the mail, this Apple mail privacy protection is what happens is that an email gets sent to you. Email will open it. For, oh, sorry. Apple will open it first and then they'll, then they'll put it in your inbox. So what that does is that inflates the open rates. So even Apple has seen it, but you haven't seen it. And so you really can't trust completely open rates. And that's that. So the trend is to make sure you are looking at all of your metrics, not just open rates, but open rates, 
click rates, conversion rates. You're looking at donor retention. You're looking at first time donors. You're just looking at everything on an email, not just open rates. I don't know how often, and I'm probably guilty of it too. When somebody says, how did the email do? And you say, oh, it it was great. It had a 24% open rate. When that happened and everything that I've seen is that now when that click happened, open rates increased by anywhere from five to 10% Mm -hmm. across all industries. Now that's not to say don't ever look at open rates. That's just to say, don't solely look at open rates. Um, Mm -hmm. I still look at open rates now that we're into this and we have a better idea of what the open rates are looking like. Like you could compare last month's open rates to this month's open rates. Mm -hmm. When I test things and I'm testing a subject line, you can still use open rates to, to see which one works better. It doesn't mean again, that open rates are bad. It just means take it with a grain of salt. That's all. So that was a big one. The other one that I'm seeing is dark mode. There's a lot of people mm-hmm. switching to dark mode, especially with emails. Uh, that dark yeah. mode's been around for for a while with with the internet, but now really with just Gmail and Apple. What's that? What that means is make sure that your email looks great on both both types of modes, right? So make sure it looks good with mm-hmm. a black background. That's mm-hmm. especially important if you're using color in any of yes. your emails, whether it's a color button or color headlines, right? So you don't want um, a navy blue button. And then if you put that on black on a black background, you're not going to see it and it's going to affect your your conversions or clicks. Yeah. So another another critical one to think about is what's your logo look like on a black background? So many times I see organizations send an email and they've got their full color logo and it's just a little white sketch outline in dark mode. And you can't read what their no- name is and you have no idea who the email's from. I mean, obviously you open it and you know who the sender is, but you lose all of your branding and all of your brand recognition just with that simple change. Oh yeah, that is that is a great point. The other one that I've seen is when you use like images with a white background, like with a yes. signature, and maybe that's what you're yes. referring to, is like a signature. And yeah, it's... <laughs> And there are ways around it. So just just be careful. That's a great study. What I'd like to do is like, do you really need email signatures, like a image signature? Does it really matter? I have my thoughts, but I, I've never... I have always been a strong opponent against putting a signature in an email. A signature block, sure. But why are you hand signing an email? That's it, like, it's, it's one of those things that is like, I always sign my direct mail pieces, so I'm going to sign my emails. Well, it's, it's not how people read email. No. And when you send it, right. And this is another thing, like, so email needs to look personal, right? So when you send an mm-hmm. email to me or I send one to you, I never sign my, put, you know, put a signed image in there. Uh, uh, right. You know, I just put my name and, and send it off. So to your point, it just kind of looks weird. Uh, yeah. I probably could spend the time on that. But so those are the two, I guess what those are the two big ones as far as last year goes was, you know, know your metrics mm-hmm. from top to bottom. And, you know, that includes unsubscribes as well. And then just know that dark mode is here. Uh, It's getting more and more popular. I'm going to ask for one more because you were talking about email formats a little bit. I saw an interesting thing happening when I was running fundraising programs where a lot of organizations were switching to text-only emails. So traditional fundraising emails are are nicely well-designed. They've got flow. They've got buttons in them. They've got photos. You can tell that it's a professional email to give that source of like, hey, we invested time. And there's quality in this, but we would sometimes buck the trend and make it look like this is actually an email coming from the executive director himself. It wasn't, but like, so what's your take on the text only email style? Have you tried it? Do you like it? Uh, So yeah, there is, and there's kind of heated debate on this. And my opinion is both of them are great tools to use depending on the type of communication you want to use. And it's kind of like a diplomatic answer, but I've used them both. We've seen great results with text-only emails, but I think that's the case. And well, we've actually tested it. We know that's the case when it is a very personal email. So if it's a if it's an email from a person at the at the nonprofit, even if it's fundraising, it doesn't matter. But if it looks if it's supposed to look like a personal email from like the president or CEO, text works better. Mm-hmm. You know, remove the buttons, make you know, put hyperlinks in there instead. Don't use fancy colors. Just make it look as authentic to a personal email as you can. I like, I love it for those cases. For cases like newsletters, other mm-hmm. things like that, yeah, it's great to use HTML, lots of images. It's okay. Uh, you want to be, 
you know, the other thing is, is, you know, kind of the, with you, when you add images, it starts making the email a lot heavier, which triggers a mm-hmm. whole bunch of other things. And so we, we get too technical in there, but to answer your question is yes, I usually call it plain text type. So mm-hmm. I learned this the hard way. We ever talk about fails. Plain text is one thing. If you send a plain text email, that's fine, but you won't be able to get any tracking on it. Mm-hmm. I call it a plain text type. There's probably other ways. Letter style is another thing I've used, yeah. which is it looks like it's plain text, but it's not. It still has the ability to be tracked so that you can see mm-hmm. open things and stuff. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a great way. I think it's best if you're a good email marketer, you have both in your back pocket. Yeah, I agree. I, I definitely want to preface when I say plain text, I mean that style that looks like it's it's just text, but you should always be using every bit of email tracking that you have as a fundraiser to see how your emails are performing. Make sure that they're getting where they need to go. Please don't send a fundraising email from an Outlook account if you if you can avoid it, right? Right, and there's actually and there's technical reasons for that as well because uh, you know not get too far in the weeds there, but that actually can hurt your whole, especially if it's like your organization account. Mm-hmm. You could actually be doing a lot of damage to to your organization account outlook if if you're sending fund reasons from there so just be careful be very careful <laughs> yes so 2023 we're a little bit in things have already been a little bit wild but we still got a lot of year left what do you think is going to be the hot trend this year what are you most excited for when it comes to email marketing and email fundraising yeah so there's two here again and the one we've kind of already touched on a little bit and that's Multi-channel, mm-hmm. which I really think nonprofits really need to step up and and start using multi-channel more and more. Uh, other other organizations or other sectors are using it, but I think, and I'm not just talking direct mail and email. I know we kind of briefed talked on that a little bit at the beginning, but I'm talking you know email, direct mail, phone call, display mm-hmm. ads, SMS, like all those touch points need to happen, and and how to integrate them, and how to marry them, how to automate them. And I think that's a big one it's really going to help you. It's really going to help you fundraise. It's going to make your life a little easier, I think, as well. A lot more work at the front, but there's lots of programs that can help you with that. And the other one is called hyper-personalization. And this is fun because with nonprofits, we're still working on personalization. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the digital world is moving into what's called hyper-personalization. If you're not familiar with that, it's using data in real time with AI and predictive analysis to personalize emails. So personalized emails in real time, and that's going to be huge. Mm -hmm. This is across the board, not just nonprofits. So I'm expanding a little bit here, but it's going to be big. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess to speak to that is nonprofits, we kind of need to feel like we need to catch up because I think we're still a little behind in the personalization aspect of emails and not even using first names, which I almost hesitate to call it personalization anymore. It right. is, but it's kind of table stakes at this point. Yeah, yeah, it's like you—that's the basics of personalization, and and brands are doing other things, and organizations are doing other things, and it's mm-hmm. it's hard because if you're personalizing very well, your supporters won't even know it. Right. All they'll know is, man, this email speaks to me. Like this is the exact email I needed today. You know, they they know what I like. They know my name. They they knew I was doing this. Like. They're not, it's not even, they're just going to think, oh, this is a great email. So kind of, mm-hmm. you know, I don't say it doesn't get enough credit, but that's what a great personalized email does. And hyper personalization is just going to take that and make it happen mm-hmm. that much faster. I agree. Great points. All right. I think we would be remiss to have a conversation about building successful email fundraising programs without thinking about the peripheral touch points outside of email that help make an email program run smoothly. So uh, other than personalized, great domain, all of the critical functions of building a good email, what do you think are the one or two things fundraisers and marketers need to consider beyond the email to make sure their email program is successful? Right. And and we did touch a little bit this on this, which I've really been learning about. And that's strategy. I think that we Mm -hmm. really need to, before you even sit down to write an email, before you sit down to write a direct mail piece, you need to have the whole campaign planned out, scheduled out. You need to know your segments, you need to know your audience points or your audience, excuse me, your channels, and you need to know the goal, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So often, I think sometimes we kind of, I'd say gloss over the goal, but it kind of gets muddled in the process. And I think you really need to focus on this before you even begin 
jumping in and designing an email. That seems like the big thing with me is like, hey, we're going to send an email. What's it going to look like? And it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, let's step back a second here. Uh, I know you really want to see what it's going to look like, but let's talk about the copy or let's talk about the purpose. Uh, mm-hmm. So like, know your goal, whether it's raising money, whether it's attending an event, whether it's just brand awareness, right? Because everything gets filtered through that lens. Uh, and that's how you'll know whether it was successful or not. And that's how you can know when those times come, whether you should add something in the middle or not add something in the middle. Like you get those times when people are like, oh, this I have this great idea. You know, you're halfway through a campaign. I have this great idea and we should send an email. And it's like, wait a minute, does that meet our goal? And if it doesn't, can it wait? If mm-hmm. it does, great, let's add it. As we talked about, if it's email, we can put it together in a week or two and let's, you know, let's send it out. But if not, let's wait. Or maybe it needs to be, those are great ideas, but those are two emails. This is something that happens a lot, mm-hmm. which is like, oh, I, I think we should do this, this, and this. Let's put an email together and send it. And it's like, no, we're going to put three emails together. And they're going to be different emails because what you want to do is, you know, have three different calls to action mm-hmm. or like we talked about earlier. So just really knowing that, knowing how to measure it, knowing what you want. Make sure we close the loop, right? I think this kind of gets missed a lot of times with email and it's an easy way to close the loop. Once a mm-hmm. campaign is done, it doesn't end at we've reached our goal. It ends when we've thanked everybody for helping us reach mm-hmm. our goal. Um, and so mm-hmm. email is a great way to do that. Real quickly, you know, you can send an automated one right as soon as somebody donates, but then please send something. We send one a couple of days later. You can include stories. You can include updates. Uh, you know, we reached our goal. We almost reached our goal. Whatever it is, here's a story of how you helped, but just make sure we, you know, close that loop and and that'll help people come back for more, so to speak. Uh, I don't know if that's the best way to say that, but they'll, they'll yeah. be, you know, you just want to be gracious with them and, and let them know that, you know, you appreciate the work they did or the help they gave. Like we talked about earlier, it's a relationship with your donors and you're stewarding that relationship. And if you're asking for something, coming back and telling them the success that they had by contributing to it uh, is so critical to maintaining not just having that success at a single point in time, but maintaining success over the long term. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right, John, this was a fantastic conversation. I appreciate you so much for joining us. You are a wealth of knowledge when it comes to this niche of the the fundraising sector. I always know that I can turn to you and get inspiration for a campaign or what's coming in the email space. But for, for those of us listening in the audience here today, wanting to go a little bit deeper or learn more or connect with you directly, what are some ways that they can they can dive deeper? Yeah. So if you want to connect with me and uh, I love to connect with people, I love to help people. As you talked about, the professor in me likes to help people out. So if you ever have a question or uh, I had somebody recently say, hey, I just saw this email. What do you think about it? Feel free to contact me. The best ways to do that, uh, one is through LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. I respond to comments or you can direct message me there. I also have a website, uh, NPO Campaign Lab. Dot com. Uh, that's where I put a lot of my tests and campaigns that we've run that that have been successful or even not successful. Uh, so that's another way to kind of just see, learn more about email, mm-hmm. learn more about digital campaigns, learn more about testing, which I enjoy doing. And you know that 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 website is based is meant to be a resource for people. Uh, when I had when I started in a nonprofit, I really didn't have anything. I felt like. I could go to everything was e-commerce was like, Oh, mm-hmm. but nonprofit is different. Right. I mean, yep. so I wanted to create something that was more geared toward nonprofit and that's, that's my passion. That's my heart. So there's that website, but please, yeah, either of those places, feel free to reach out to me. I'll make sure to get back to you. Awesome. We will make sure we include links to both your LinkedIn account and your testing website and uh, the show notes as well. All right. Well, John, I've got nothing else for you. I appreciate so much your time and energy for joining us today and the wealth of information you shared for me, for our, for our audience, and for our team here. Thank you again. Thank you, David. It's always a pleasure.